Recently, my board asked me if we are properly insured. It got me to thinking about our current coverage. We have a DNO insurance and general liability policy. Are there other types of insurance you commonly see nonprofits have or any other types you think should be standard policies for any organization looking to protect themselves? That's a great question. And I mean, I think the the first place you should probably go to talk to is your insurance agent. And I mean, it, it feels like they might not give you the, if you don't trust your insurance agent, you should probably find a better insurance agent, <laughs> right? But you should, you should come up with an insurance agent you trust to give you, um, to give you discussions of coverage that you, they think is appropriate for you. So absolutely 100%, um, having, um, general liability insurance with good limits on it, limits that make sense for the size of your organization. That's one, um, Number two, I think, would be DNO insurance or directors and officers insurance. Um, what directors and officers insurance is, is it protects the board as well as staff members from accidental mistakes. So um, depending on your what your nonprofit does, that might mean a lot of different things. But um, if someone if someone loses a lot of money because something that your nonprofit did, that that the insurance will actually kick in and protect you against being sued from what some from some of those things um, personally, which is good a lot of times because if you don't have DNO insurance in some cases and you do get sued for something, um, the organization doesn't necessarily have an obligation to support you. And by having DNO insurance, then you get an insurance company is going to have a lawyer available for you so that they can the lawyer for the insurance company who absolutely does not want to pay and has lots of um, experience in protecting you for those kinds of things um, can step in and do those kinds of things as well. So directors and officers insurance is another one that I'd absolutely recommend. The third one, and this is sort of more this is more important now than it used to be, is cybersecurity insurance. So as a nonprofit, theoretically, you have a list of donors. (laughs) You have all of their personal information. Uh, You may have things like credit card numbers somewhere floating around. You may have things like um, check bank account numbers on canceled checks that you haven't necessarily gotten rid of. Um, Lots of things that could potentially get you into big trouble, as well as the opportunity for somebody to execute some sort of ransomware attack on you where they lock all your systems and prevent you from doing any work until you pay whatever, some number of Bitcoin to some shady Russian outfit. Oh. Right. So, so cybersecurity insurance protects you from those kinds of things as well. It's important to read what the coverage is actually covering because you want to make sure it's doing what you think it does. But I would absolutely recommend those three. Number one, um, general liability directors and officers, and nowadays cybersecurity insurance. I think those would be ones that I would be looking at. If you have vehicles, obviously you have to have vehicle insurance. That's not something that's optional at all. Um, but yeah, those three and potentially vehicle insurance as well. I was just going to pipe in and say, I also think being able to share that since you had a board member ask it, I think it's good to proactively share this with your board, you know, the details that you are covered, because it's something that I think some board members are concerned about. Some don't ask, some do ask, should be asking, right? Just from a, you know, protecting the organization standpoint, but particularly the DNO insurance, because I know board members always want to know, you know, if for some reason, yeah there is some oversight or something they did incorrectly or, and it was truly not intentional, right? It wasn't like some intentional malfeasance, but, you know, just an honest mistake, like knowing that they're protected, that actually helps too. And should be part of, if board members aren't asking you about it, you should proactively share that with them, particularly that policy in my, my humble opinion, because I know that's one of the things when I've been recruited to boards before, that's one of the first things is, do you have DNO insurance? Because I don't plan to do anything, you know, that's going to get me in trouble, but I can't trust my other fellow board members. No, just kidding. Sorry for any of those who are listening. Um, nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. Welcome to Nonprofit Everything, the podcast where hosts Andy Shurick and Stacy Wedding answer your questions about all things nonprofit. 
Hello, and welcome to the Nonprofit Everything Podcast. I'm Andy Schurich. I'm here with Stacy Wedding, and we're here to talk about nonprofit stuff. So the way this works is you send us questions. You can email them to us. You can click the big yellow button on the Nonprofit Everything webpage. Uh, you can find us on the socials. You send us those questions, and Stacy and I will do our best to answer them. And if we don't know the answer or we feel unsure or we think that the question is especially suited to someone with some specific expertise, we will rope in a guest expert. So go ahead and send us those questions. We really like it. Um, It's fun to hear what is on other people's minds. Uh, Sometimes sometimes it's surprising. We we get questions. We're like, I didn't realize people were thinking about that. And those are the fun ones to answer as well. So send them to us and we will we will get right to it. I'm the ED of a nonprofit of three staff with an annual budget of $250,000. In a recent workshop I attended, the trainer said that the board chair and ED should have weekly meetings. That feels like overkill to me, and candidly, there just isn't enough to talk about. What is your recommendation for the frequency of these meetings based on our size, and what exactly should these meetings cover? Perhaps I'm missing something. Oh, I don't think you're missing anything. I think you are (laughs) spot on. Yeah, me too. (laughs) I was like weekly meetings. So, gosh, I I have a like, I would understand that if you were like an all volunteer board and you had like, and the board was doing work and actual like, you know, doing the job of staff, like I could see where maybe weekly meetings might be needed. But in this case, right, you've got $250,000 annual budget, your, I I mean, there's not enough, like without it starting to get into micromanagement in my mind, that's what would worry me about thinking of it. Like if you meet too regularly, you run that risk of then it getting very operational and that's exactly what you don't want it to be. And so, I would push back against the trainer in the workshop because, A, I don't think one size fits all. I don't think there's a rule of thumb with this, just like a lot of things with, you know, nonprofit and boards. We can't just say, yes, this is the the way you do it all the time. I mean, I think it depends on your stage of development. I think it depends on all the things going on. You might be in the middle of some really intensive I don't know, initiative or a lot happening that perhaps you're having more frequent meetings. But I think in general, I mean, what I hear more commonly is like once a month, which is a far departure from once a week. But again, I don't want to even hold that out there as like a gold standard because I think it depends. The cadence depends on what it is going on in your organization. What do you think, Andy? Is that am I being like really hard on this one or what? No, I was like, I, I'm trying really hard not to go down the, like, let's talk about the quality of nonprofit training for a minute. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I feel yeah. like that's the, that's an more interesting conversation than this question, because this is like, just like you st- said, it's so, it depends so much on what the organization is and where they are. And I can't, I mean, what's even in an organization with three staff, like what's the the role that doesn't change the role of the board chair in relation to no. the executive director. It's the same exact role. It is. So, so why do you need constant face-to-face communication between those two people? It's not like, it's not like they have any decisions to make weekly. So no. it's very, very strange. It's very strange. It is. And yes, we should, someone ask us, someone write in and ask us a question about what we think about <laughs> trainings for nonprofits that are available out there and what to look for in your trainings and what not to look for. No, yeah. um, in all seriousness though. Yeah. I, I mean, and so this part two of this question, right? So I think part one is it depends and cadence needs to be something you talk about with your board chair and and talk about what are the things we're trying to accomplish at these meetings and then thinking about I mean, what I have found to be the most productive meetings that are between the board chair and ED are things that talk about, you know, like, what do they need support or help from each other on, right? What is, does the ED need the board chair to really kind of rally the troops or motivate people or get people, you know, actually doing things, Um, you know, so I think sort of request of each other is a part of it. I think sort of high level, like 30,000 foot level of, are there, you know, are there 
big partnerships we're exploring. But if if you're if they're big, they're probably not like this isn't something that, you know, for example, on a weekly basis is changing. I mean, so uh, we're exploring this big partnership opportunity, which also would be probably something on a board agenda. But you know, or we've got this employee, I mean, you only have a staff of three, but we have this employee or volunteer who's really difficult that we had to fire from their position. And we think there could be some trouble with it. And we just, you know, like that kind of like, so I always say like, what are the red flag items that like, you don't want anyone, you don't want your board chair surprised about what are those yellow flag items that are like, you're keeping your eyes on, but you want someone to be in the know, or you might want a thought partner on, Um, And then just kind of like talking together about what are some big upcoming milestones where the board and staff are going to need to partner. Is it, is it, you know, the annual gala or, you know, something else like the audit where the board or, you know, a committee of the board plays a role in that. I mean, so thinking about sort of what are those milestones, what are those things that are, that are just need to be kept top of mind. So to me, that's, That's what I would put on an agenda is I literally would have it be like yellow and red flags, key sort of high level things that we both need to be in the loop on. Like if, you know, from a board chair perspective, if the board chair finds out that, you know, several board, you know, or a couple board members are planning on transitioning off, like those kinds of things. But, but really thinking about what are those high level items and then, you know, is there anything we're just losing sleep about either one of us and how can we support each other? To me, those feel like that's what the agenda is. And that might mean like sometimes all is smooth sailing and you don't have a lot to talk about and great. So you pop on, you say, hi, how's it going for five minutes? And then you go about your business or it's something that's a little longer. And and so just having that flexibility, I think is so critical. Um, so so you you have that trainer contact me and I'm going to counter every <laughs> single thing they probably told you. Andy, here's one for you. We received several programmatic grants in 2023, totaling about $100,000 that have a grant period through the end of 2024. Our accountant told us that best practice is to record grants in the year they are received. But then my budget looks smaller in 2024 because the funds were received last year, even though we're still expending staff time and programmatic expenses for the grant this year. How do we record this or explain this in our financials so it doesn't look like we're negative 100000 this year? I'm really confused about how to record this accurately so that it tells the correct story. <laughs> oh, I think if, this is one of those questions that I think I've heard a thousand times because it is very confusing and the rules are different. This is one of those weird accounting things where the rules are different for nonprofits than they are for everybody else. And it makes people crazy. It makes like I've had arguments with development staff about how it works, um, arguments with program staff about how it works. It, it's it's just nuts. And you just have to sort of accept it because it's the rules. It's one of those things that's the rules. And when so you I'm say the summarize. rules, so is there some guy like FASB or something? Yeah, this or? is straight okay. up gap. This is straight up okay. FASB okay. and gap. This is like, okay. <laughs> there's no getting around it. And I, I'm, I'm, I think it's funny that your accountant told you that it was best practice. It's actually, you have to do it. <laughs> like it's a, Your accountant is very nice, <laughs> but there's no way around it. So I'm going to summarize the question because I think it, just just to make it sort of shorter and more more like digestible. So what happens is somebody gives you money and then you don't spend the money right away. You spend the money later. And in the, in the meantime, between the time you get the money and later, your fiscal year ends. <laughs> and so you have to report based on that fiscal year ending and you're annoyed because you got the money in this year, but you're going to spend it next year. Right. And then what that looks like is that next year, even though you're spending money, you got it the previous year. So it looks like you're terrible at your job because all of a sudden you're going to look like you're losing money in a year. Right. So this is true. And it's just the way that it works. (laughs) It's just the way that it's just the way that nonprofit financials need to be done. Um, Let me I'll explain why it's this way. Right. So. When you get a grant, and this isn't every scenario, some scenarios are a little bit different, but typically when people give you money, they're giving money and they're giving it to you what's considered to be unconditional. And unconditional means very specific gap language where unconditional means that 
they're giving you the money and there's no there's no condition on the money that you have to do something before you actually get to keep it. And that if you don't do that thing, you have to give it back to the donor. So there's like two pieces of it. Like there's a condition that you need to fulfill in order to be able to keep it. And the second one is that they've specifically told you, if you don't do this thing, you have to give me this money back. So that's like a conditional grant. Um, Most grants, I mean, that's rare when you think about it. Like most grants or most donations, a donor just gives you money and they're like, here. And they can give you a restriction. They can say, I want you to spend this on landscaping, right? They don't say that, but they say other things. <laughs> I want you to spend this money on this one thing. And so you have to do that. And if you don't do it, you get a slap on the hand, right? You're like, bad, bad. You know, your auditors get mad at you. They write an audit finding that you didn't do it right. You might get in the newspaper. There's all kinds of bad things that happen, but you don't have to give the money back to the donor, strangely, like, because it's just a restriction you're just, you're just a bad nonprofit. Right? If you do that wrong, you're just a bad nonprofit. So because you don't have to get the give the money back, and this is where this whole thing kind of hinges, is because you don't have to give the money back, even if it's restricted, even if it's for a grant, um, that means it's yours. And when it's yours, you have to recognize it when it's yours. And it's yours on the day that they gave it to you. So in this case, it's yours in 2023. So you got it in 2023. It belongs to you in 2023, all of it, regardless of whether or not you've done the program. So it gets recorded as revenue on your accounts in 2023 and it stays there. It doesn't go anywhere. At the end of the year, it washes off to net assets. It lives in your net assets, probably net assets with donor restrictions. But then next year you spend it, you spend it and actually just decreases the amount of money that lives in net assets with donor restrictions. So it's not like your revenues minus your expenses in 2024. What we're seeing is net assets with donor restrictions minus expenses in 2024. Mm -hmm. So the money doesn't disappear. It just doesn't show up in the same place. And part of the difficulty that we have in having this conversation is that boards, everybody's basically used to looking at financials that were designed for a specific for-profit purpose and mean very little in a nonprofit context. So if you're looking at revenues minus expenses and like the net number, if that's like how you're, If you think you're doing a good job, if that number is positive, like that's not what you're supposed to be looking at. You should be really looking at net assets minus expenses and making sure that that number is consistently positive because you're not going to go upside down and that you're, you know, creating the massive amount of mission based on that flow through of money. So looking at revenues minus expenses, which is what you're talking about here, is like saying it it doesn't look like we're negative 100,000 for the year. Well, that's that's in a for-profit context when we're just looking at a PL where it's just profit minus loss. We don't care about that in nonprofits. We're looking at net assets and then delivering units of mission for our net assets. Um, so if your board is on you about it, like maybe have that conversation with them. Talk to them about like, well, really, it's about net assets. Like this this money isn't used for this this money that we've got on our net assets account. It's not useful for anything except for delivering units of mission. That's what it's there for. So if we brought it in two years ago, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, it doesn't matter because it's still going to be expended to make our mission happen. And the P&L part of it, revenues minus expenses, who cares? Sometimes it's positive. Sometimes it's negative. We just go on with our lives and do our thing. So is it every finance person's dream, Andy, to just have it nice, neatly tied up Right. Like in the fiscal year, I'm going to assume just because you don't have to deal with these things. Is that sort of the I like, you know, I've worked with nonprofits before where they're like, oh, my gosh, it's the end of fiscal. And we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get this, you know, grant spent or we're trying to get this done so it doesn't carry over. Is it this? I mean, there's probably a lot of variables for that. But do you find that this is sort of like in an ideal world, people love it, just clean, nice, neat, tidy, cleaned up? by the end of the fiscal so you don't have to worry about this or try to explain it to others? I think that's a little bit of laziness. So, Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the what you have to do, so if you, so specifically with restrictions, if somebody gives you $1,000 and it's restricted for something and you haven't spent all 1,000 of it by the time that you need to do some kind of report. So some nonprofits report monthly, some do it quarterly. You have to do it annually. That's a requirement. So if you're reporting annually and you haven't spent all that thousand dollars, you just have to keep track of it. You can say they gave me this thousand dollars for this restricted purpose. I spent 500 of it. I've got 500 and I need to keep I need to remember that this 500 still needs to be spent for this one restriction. So it needs to be tracked. We need to keep track of it. It's on the 
It's on the 990. It's on, not specifically on the 990, but it's there in, in the rest of it. It's definitely in your audited financial statements, although it might not be in a public statement. And you for sure need to keep track of it because your donor is going to ask. Like, I gave you $1,000 to do this thing. Show me when you did it. The fact that the fiscal year kind of chopped it in half, like, like we have no control over the calendar. It just goes, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. if somebody gives me the money the day before the fiscal year ends and restricts it, like, I'm not trying to rush to get rid of it just so I don't have to, like, remember something. That's, that's just not being, I don't know. I, I mean, I think maybe the personality of people that go into accounting and finance like things clean, like things to total to zero and like yeah. tie at the bottom. That might be some sort of internal need that they have. Yes. But, yes. It, but it doesn't mean that life works like that for sure. Of course not, <laughs> especially nonprofit life. Yeah. Yeah. And there is, you know, and, and I've seen it too. Like you'll see like a, a nonprofit board will require that the nonprofits balance their budget. They'll say, I want to see that the revenues ex- exceed the expenses. And that's because a hundred percent of them are coming from the for-profit world where if revenues don't aren't more than expenses, that means you don't make any profit, which means you get in trouble with your shareholders. Right. But in a nonprofit context, that might just mean that we got a lot of money last year and we haven't spent it all. Cause we're not crazy. Like we salted some of it away so that we don't have to like tell our constituents that, oh, sorry, we can't do this program any year this year because we got a lot last year and we just like flushed it all through really fast so we could get some zeros on the financial statements. Like it's just not a very smart way to go. Um, and it, but it's, it's hard to teach your board that I think boards, they're coming with their for-profit mindset and they don't really think about it as like, it's just a date on the calendar. (laughs) Like just cause it's June 30th doesn't mean anything changed. (laughs) Yeah. So How often should an emeritus board meet? What do they do? Well, it's interesting because I am not a fan of any board other than your one governing board because, dear Lord, that's enough to deal with as it is. Um, So, right, historically speaking, emeritus board members, it's, it's... kind of like an honorary role. Usually it's advisory, right? It's it's usually in an advisory capacity. It's usually a board member potentially who like had a long-term commitment and really went above and beyond. Like it's it's supposed to be a really unique distinction. Like for like a true honor to be called an emeritus board member. It's not something you give to every board member when they leave. It's not something you give to every, you know, board officer when they leave. It's really that person that like you were like, wow, whether they're a founder in some capacity or they've just really, you know, done, gone above and beyond the call of duty is usually where you start to see like that, that terminology come. So the first thing is like being really clear on. I don't know who makes up, you know, like if you have an emeritus board, I don't know who makes up or comprises yours, but being selective, it shouldn't be this long laundry list. Like it should be just a few really special people who want to stay involved. And perhaps you feel like you don't want to involve them in a committee or in something that's not a board type position. So you're like, oh, we're going to create this emeritus board. I, I would really say, how does, what's the purpose of it? Like, why why have another body to manage? So I'm not a fan, and I haven't seen a lot of models where you see people with an emeritus board. Like, I've seen it where you say an emeritus director, like emeritus trustee, but, but it's it's more like that person then by way of that title gets to come to one board meeting a year or gets to come and be an advisor to the board or perhaps just gets special, you know, honor and designation at events or like whatever invited to your VIP receptions whatever you get to define it and make it what it is so like there's no like black or white but it's about really being intentional about not creating yet another structure you have to manage and then what's that vote and how does that correspond to your governing board like that's that can get really wonky you should have one voting board of directors and that's your governing board now if you have emeritus directors on there that you still want to vote then why they shouldn't be emeritus, right? Emer- the nature of an emeritus, emeritus is advisory. Like it's not a voting, it's not supposed to be a voting position. I, I don't know. That's my my stance. And from what I've seen, thoughts? Yeah, I, I find the whole thing very silly. <laughs> 
I was like, like, so the, the idea behind emeritus and it wasn't like, it didn't come from like a board member or anything. It was just like a, a retired professor. And he's always had, and it's, it's a gendered noun emeritus, right? It's a retired professor and he's always been around and he's not a professor anymore because he's a retired, but he still wants to use the title professor. So he just sticks emeritus professor on it, which means <laughs> I used to be a professor. That's all it is. And nonprofits have converted this into yes. some kind of like honor that you're going to give somebody who's like, just can't be bothered to come to board meetings anymore or, and um, not to call anybody out, but there are organizations who have dead people as emeritus on their board. So I don't think ghosts get to vote. I'm pretty sure that ghosts get to, don't get to vote. So I don't know. It might be in your bylaws. You could have a ghost vote in your bylaws. If, I don't know. Um, but, but it's really, it's, it's almost like a development thing or a relationship thing where you want to keep this person's name involved with your organization but they're really not on the board or they're retired or they've moved to Florida or whatever it is. And they can't just, they're not going to be on the board anymore. Or they said, I don't want to be on your board anymore, but you freak out because you still want them. I mean, back in the day we used to be in, the letterhead was a big deal. Like yes. you'd have the, you'd have the nonprofit letterhead <laughs> totally. and like, like either along the top or on the bottom or down the left-hand side or something, you'd have a list of all the board members. And it was this tremendous pain. Like every time you'd, a board member would leave or come back on, you'd be like, okay, great. We get to order more letterhead, right? Because it's yes. all, all the names are new. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we do that anymore. No. But we used to do that, right? And so you still want that person's name on the letterhead because, I don't know, they were the mayor of your town or they were very famous or something. And for some reason, you want that person's name still involved. So- I don't know. I think if you're going to do it, just be honest about it and say like, look, this is somebody that we, you know, that we want to represent us as a brand ambassador or an influencer. Right. And yes. they're just like, they don't have to be on your board, but they can have their face on your website or something like that. But, but don't pretend it's some sort of governance role for them because it's, no. it's not, it's not. It is not. And there should never be more than one or two of them. I mean, what right. do you, Yeah. I don't know. I, I find the thing very, whole thing very, very silly. <laughs> I, I appreciate that what you said with the original, with the origins. How many times do we do that in society, right? Something <laughs> right. starts one way. And then, yeah. yeah. And then I was like some, you know, wackadoodle decides that now we're going to apply this to nonprofits and create mm -hmm. this. And I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, I have, in all fairness, though, I will say, I mean, where I've seen it work well is when it's very clear, you're very clear on the role, like, and to your point, and it's not voting, and it's, it is all the things you said, Andy, but like for people, if they were, there was a handful of founders of an organization or founding board members that really stuck with it and gave a lot financially, gave a lot of time over the years, those kinds of things are where it like rises to the level of, okay, like, we are trying to now term you off because we're actually, we've grown up and we don't want you on the, you know, it's not healthy to have you on the board forever. So we're going to term you off. And so what, what do we do, right? Because your name is a legacy name with this organization. And so those kinds of things to your point, like, I think there's times that it can be beneficial. So, but it is, you're right. It has nothing to do from a governance standpoint. Don't make it about that. Um, and save yourself some time and energy. Gosh, there's too many other important things to do. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate that you've taken the time out of your day to listen to the podcast. Stacey and I like the questions. Go ahead and send them to us. Uh, let us know how you like the podcast. Is this something that... Uh, you make part of your regular rotation. Uh, let us know that. If there's stuff we could do better, we absolutely want to hear about that too. So send us your feedback, send us your questions, rate us, share us, all that good stuff. And we will see you in two weeks. <laughs>